There's a moment, right? When you're hiking and it's the early morning and there are a bunch of trees and you know that there's a view just waiting for you, but you can't see it, you can't see it. And then suddenly there it is, a clearing, a framed shot through the trees of the most majestic scene you have ever seen. My name is Colby Bloom, and today is day seven of our Painting the Wilderness 10-Day World of Color Challenge. Today, we are taking things a little bit easier after the really challenging project we had yesterday with the Red Rock Mountain, and we're focusing on mountains again, but instead of one specific, very detailed mountain, what we're doing is framing a shot of a simple kind of mountain gradient, layers of mountain, one on top of the other, slowly shifting colors, framed by branches coming in on either side to kind of mimic that first look of a scene that you get when you're hiking to a specific destination, right? When you can, when you finally see what you're looking for through the trees, there seems to be this perfect clearing. It is a really magical experience for any avid hiker, or even if you've never been hiking, you get to paint it. So I'm really excited about this one. It's called Gradient Peak and let's dive in. All right, Gradient Peak. So the main thing you need to know about this is mostly it's a mountain scene, right? And we're building up slow layers of mountain uh, a little bit at a time. The most important thing about layered mountains, we already talked about this in Gray Lake, right? That was project number two of this 10-day challenge. The most important thing to know about layered mountains is the background mountains are going to be the lightest. In order to make your colors light with watercolor, you add water. That's how you make light value paint with watercolor because essentially you are using the white of the paper as a mixing agent to make your whatever color it is lighter than it would normally be, okay? So, uh, but before we even get to the mountains, we're painting the sky and we're painting a very, very delicate, like just little pops of yellow up against a blue sky. So I'm starting with uh, getting my paper wet with clean water and then this is Quinn Gold, and I'm painting just, I did one stroke with pigment and the rest water, just kind of blending it in from that right side toward the center. I added a little, a couple strokes of gold ochre at the top. So this is just like really kind of wisps. I'm painting just wisps of yellow coming into the painting. Uh, and I'm leaving behind plenty of white space. That white space is where we're going to add the blue. So it's really important that you leave plenty of white space because we're going to very carefully paint blue on top of these yellow wisps, but not create green, hopefully. <laughs> so that's the goal. And I'm gonna show you how actually I failed in some aspects, but in the sky, I didn't. I was able to keep the sky blue and yellow without really mixing much, much green. So we let the sky dry all the way, and then I re-wet it. And one of the benefits of doing one layer and then letting it dry and then doing another layer is that you don't wash out the first color uh, so that you can let the yellow be where it is and then add the blue. So I'm using idanthrene blue here. I added tons of water, so it's very, very light. Um, and then I'm just kind of pushing it in, gently pushing it in, and then using a thirsty brush to lift where it's kind of moving into the yellow a little too much, right? So this is a, sl a slower process, but it doesn't have to be super accurate. I don't have to get like a really straight flat wash. I like all that texture. If there's going to be texture, like there's a bunch of different strokes you can see in the blue, that's okay. I also want there to be plenty of luminosity, which means there's plenty of white space. So using lots of water to add in that blue and using a thirsty brush, which is a clean, damp brush to lift any pigment that's getting into the yellow. So we let that sky dry and now we're painting the first layer of mountain. This layer is the very lightest, right? This is the lightest layer, which means it's very watery. So I'm using idanthrene blue, very watery idanthrene blue. And as you can see, <laughs> I, th I was not really careful in thinking about how the yellow might affect my layer here. And so this first mountain layer that I'm adding, it's green. Right, like it's, it's this very transparent layer of blue mixed with um, 
you know, glazed on top of that layer of sky. And so it kind of turned it green, which messed with my color palette a little bit. This is not, I was not intending to have green be in this, um, in this painting, but that's okay. We push forward anyway. I tried to kind of cover up the yellow by adding a little bit of indigo to the idanthrene blue. It worked okay, um, but you know, I wasn't gonna fuss too much about it because at that point it kind of is what it was. If I wanted to not have my mountain be green, then what I needed to do was sketch out at least that first mountain layer ahead of time and only paint the yellow in the sky, not like painting it across the paper and then painting the mountain on top of the sky. So that's okay. So I did that first layer, very light. The next layer, I added a tiny bit more pigment, just a little bit more pigment um, to make it, uh, to paint that next layer all the way across. Then I let it dry. For the third layer, I wanted to slowly, because the goal was to slowly transition from blue to kind of blue violet. And so I added a tiny, tiny bit of Quin Rose, of Quinacridone Rose to my like indigo, idanthrine blue, light value mix. So I painted that layer, this is the third mountain layer, and then similar again to Grey Lake, I'm using just the tip of my brush, like my brush footprint basically, to create, to imply that there are trees going across this mountain layer. Um, they don't have to be perfect, they don't have to be super thin, it's just to create like a, the, a tree top texture basically. So now I'm going to mix even more like blue violet, but I really don't want it to be violet, I still want it to be blue violet. So I have idanthrine blue, I have a little bit of quinacridone rose, and you know, as you're mixing, the, the cool thing about mixing is that you're always gonna get a different color, right? It's gonna be unique pretty much every single time. And so I'm showing you this like up, this zoomed up uh, view of the mixing because it's it can be really fun on your palette to mix different colors. So I really wanted a blue violet color, like a warm blue. So it's not quite violet, but it's also not, you know, it's not like a cool blue. It's on its way to becoming a violet color. Um, and I get that by adding just a hint of quinacridone rose with my blue colors, with that indigo and with, um, with idanthrine blue. So then I'm going to slowly add a little bit more quinacridone rose to make it slightly more violet. And I'm adding more color so it's more pigmented, right? It's not just adding different colors. It's also uh, affecting um, the pigment to water ratio. So I want the colors to slowly get more vibrant and darker as I keep adding the mountain layers. Uh, briefly there, I counted up my mountain layers. I typically like to do an odd number of mountain layers, but that does that, like nominally, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, but I'm adding, uh, as, as I'm continuing to get darker, in order to make my mountain layers darker, I'm adding slightly more indigo. So instead of just relying on mainly idanthrine blue as my blue agent, uh, for this final mountain layer, I added a little bit, I added more indigo and a little bit of quinacridone rose to that indigo. And you'll notice that I used the same like little puddle on my palette there, right? I used the same puddle so that I was working with the same mixture as I was slowly building up these mountain layers. One key thing to remember about mountain layers is you let each one dry. Each one has to be dry before you work on the next one to get that crisp edge. Okay, now the last part of this scene is the frame, right? Because we're not just painting these mountain layers, we are painting these mountain layers as if we are just barely coming upon the scenic overlook that you know you were promised at the beginning of this hike. So the, the, mountain, the mountain range is like, peeking through the trees. So we're gonna frame this scene with thin little branches peeking out from, like, yeah, peeking out from out of the scene, right? So we're gonna start on the edges, all four sides. We're gonna go all the way around, starting from the tape and gently pulling out and using a dark color. Could be indigo, could be galaxy black, could be Payne's gray, doesn't really matter what the dark color is. Now, the first three branches, I used a small round number two brush, and then I switched. Um, and I wanted to show you how you can do it both ways. You can use a small round number two or a small detail brush, but then I switched to what's called a liner brush. A liner brush is kind of like a round brush, except it's longer. It's e the brushes are elongated, so it's easier to create lines without accidentally making them too thick. So this is a Wonder Forest line brush, um, and I spent probably a good 15 minutes just adding 
tiny little branches coming out. And the way that I like to do branches is I like to pull. So I start from the tape and then pull and then do little forks, right? Add little forks kind of branching in and out and uh, really thin branches. You can do as many or as few as you want. Then I added a few dots on top, just kind of like some, some blobs, really, some marks on top of some of the branches, as if there were some dwindle, dwindling leaves that were still there. At one point I thought, maybe I'm gonna try to turn this into, into like birds. Like maybe I can turn some of these into like a bird silhouette. Um, but I, every time I tried to paint like a bird silhouette, it just ended up looking not like a bird and that's okay. <laughs> so I think that's, uh, what I'm painting right now. That's one of the things that was happening. I was like, I think I'm going to try to paint a little body and then a little beak and some little tails. And it just didn't really work the way that I was hoping it would. And so that's cool. I moved on and but it did give me an idea for maybe some other time I want to try, like maybe one thing I want to practice is to practice painting bird silhouettes so that I could potentially in the future paint something similar to this and paint a bird on top of it. So after I decided to give up on the birds, I painted a few more blobs uh, to look like trees. You didn't, I mean, to look like leaves. You don't have to add the leaves. Um, I, and then I decided to add a few more like, uh, brambles coming out from the bottom and there you go that's that's the whole scene especially after yesterday after you know that red rock scene that had a lot of detail I wanted this one to be fairly simple but look deceptively complicated <laughs> you know so that's kind of what this gradient peak was supposed to be um, now let's do the loved and learned so here's the thing about this I loved the sky loved the sky and then if you take away the sky, I actually really, really liked the gradient moving from um, blue-green down to blue-violet. I thought it was really cool. But the sky with the, with the gradient mountains together, it was a color combo that just looked slightly not realistic to me. Now, it doesn't. I, you don't have to shoot for realism. You don't have to shoot for, oh, this is definitely a color scheme I might see in real life. And who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I would see something like this. But... Um, ideally, my mountains were supposed to stay blue, right? They were supposed to stay blue and then gradually grow more violet. And that's okay. It's all good. I think it still looks really fun and whimsical. And, uh, and so it's important to note that, like, I love the sky separately and I love the mountains separately. And together, I thought they, they worked, but I wish that they would have been a little different. And that's okay. Uh, I loved using a liner brush. I don't use them very often, and I've discovered I just really liked it. So I would, especially if you like to paint little, like, spindly thin branches, definitely invest in a liner brush. Um, things that I learned, the color combo didn't really make sense for me. Maybe put more branches. Maybe make the branches don't go as far into the center as I did to give the mountain a little bit better of a view. Um, I would say maybe leave more light space in the mountains for some fog. Um, and really, that's about it. I thought this scene was super fun. I really hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. And I will see you next time.